Hello and welcome back to Quiet on the Set. I'm your host, Phil Biadrone. This is our second episode and we have not been can- We just got canceled. Huh. All right, well, um, just keep rolling for a little bit, okay? I mean, I already wrote this monologue, so let's just launch right into it. Okay, so what's going on in the world today? The Brexit is the biggest news. For those of you who don't know what the Brexit is, it's Britain's exit from the European Union. Okay, big deal, okay? I'm not fooled by your cute name, okay? When Phil worked at Applebee's, I didn't call it Fapplebee's and try to disguise it, you know what I'm saying? So why does Britain want to leave the European Union? Because at this point, I think it's gonna be like a Backstreet Boys situation and they're gonna to try to Nick Carter it and it's gonna fail miserably. So why does Britain want to exit the European Union? Well, it was the recession that really took a toll on Europe, and especially some countries within the European Union, such as Greece. Greece really tanked during the recession. In fact, it got so bad they were only saved by their fantastic yogurt and John Stamos, who was equally as smooth and delicious and creamy. In fact, Greece was getting to be so bad they had to change the name to oil, but Greece is the word. It's the word. It's the word. It's got groove. It's got feeling. So, Britain decides that they want to leave. Why they want to limit the number of immigrants coming in. Okay, all right. We're going to touch upon that a little bit later. But I'm telling you, Britain's going to become that uncle at Thanksgiving that begins to do holistic medicine and branches off. It's going to be a bad story. <laughs> Speaking of other stories and other cities, uh, there's an epidemic right now with sinking cities, and it's no joke. So New Orleans here in the United States is sinking at a rate of two inches per year, okay? Beijing in China is sinking at four inches a year into the earth. This is because the crazy population, all the mass production. Now, when I was a kid, I heard that if you dig deep enough, you might get a hole and you might end up in China. Huh. <laughs> anyway, I um, think that's alarming. Mexico City is actually sinking at a rate of 11 inches per year. Mass killings going on, and I'm not even talking about Trump and Hillary. <laughs> you got, 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 right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, Tarzan came out in the theaters, which I was told is a white man saving Africa, which of course is historically accurate, as we all know, especially with the Congo region. Now I'm going to celebrate my Independence Day by taking my Japanese car, loading it with Chinese fireworks, and shooting my German gun in the air in the true American fashion. Does anyone else shoot a gun on Independence Day? It's like an American tradition. For democracy, we act like ISIS infidels. I don't understand why we do it, <laughs> but it seems to be a thing, you know? Just ISIS is really bugging me these days. First of all, their name is like, isn't that like the Greek goddess of rainbows? You know, that's not the most terrifying, inspiring <laughs> name that you can imagine. It's like, hey, Holmes, don't mess with us. We're the unicorns. You know what I'm saying, bro? You know, it's like not an intimidating name. And the other thing is they, they keep on taking credit for all these horrible things that happened. They're taking credit for everything. They took credit for Baghdad most recently, taking credit for Orlando, the Paris attacks, Caitlyn Jen... Oh, Okay, that was all us. Okay, that was all us. But you, you know what I mean. It's a, in fact, only in America, only in America, that this is on the cover of my Sports Illustrated. It would. T <sighs> okay, I rate this on a beer system, and this would take two kegs to look attractive. So, <laughs> can't blame Isis for that one. But speaking of um, nothing in particular, <laughs> uh, Burger King has come out with a delicious new treat. Does anyone know what this is? It's the Mac and Cheetos. You heard me right. It's like a mozzarella stick that has gooey mac and cheese, but with the Cheeto base. Because you ever want to eat macaroni and cheese, but you're on the go, and <laughs> you don't have the utensils to eat it, you know, and, and like, I really could use a couple extra pounds. So this is the perfect, <laughs> perfect snack for you. They're riding off the coattails of Taco Bell, which had that famous Dorito taco shell, you know, and these mixes are getting more and more ridiculous. Like, who is thinking these up? I mean, it's like... I, some dude in Wisconsin who's like, like I got like a heroin level addiction to cheese and has like an IV drip, you know. <laughs> Except at this point, you're not tightening the belt, you have to loosen the belt because you are gaining quite a bit of pounds on that one. You know, fast food, uh, the following suit, Wendy's is introducing the butter and kale sandwich. There's an eggplant and uh, what else do I have? What's written on that board? Eggplant and I said M&M's. Ah, ah, anyway. I'm gonna add on a really, really low note, ladies and gentlemen. So, up next, we have a brand new segment. Followed by that, I'll be interviewing Sarah Ann Fox coming up next. Hi, 
everyone. I'm Robert Reaver. I'm Kevin Boyd. And I'm here to introduce a new series called Free to Play. So what is Free to Play? Free to Play is us reviewing free to play games, usually located on Steam. Right, usually. <laughs> Where else would they be? Well, yes. And so our first game that we're reviewing is Fractured Space. I first heard about Fractured Space a few years ago, and it wasn't free to play back then. Interesting. It was um, it was a paid game, and there was a promotion where if you downloaded it during that week, you got to keep it for free. So I jumped on it, and I downloaded it, and then I didn't play it at all until you mentioned it just now that mm -hmm. you wanted to do this, and it seems to be free to play now, so I'm not sure what's going on. It's also in early access. It's, it's an alpha. It's, a, it it's an, an alpha, alpha, so it's, it's yeah. constantly developing. So tell us about Fractured Space. So Fractured Space is a 5v5 MOBA-type game where you have five ships in space battling each other and so it, it kind of has the feeling of like um uh tank basically the well, world tanks or world of warships or steel ocean where you have two sides battling each other out and so and but instead of this it's in space it's in three dimensions you could hide behind rocks and stations and all these just these different things there and so, again, you, you start the match by start spawning on your side. And you warp into the different lanes. Right, and so there are two different lanes that are labeled Alpha and Beta. And in those lanes, you have mines and stations, where mines, capturing mines gives you experience, and stations gives you the ability to warp to the enemy station. So you got to capture the the stations so you can warp to their base, but right. also defend your stations so they can't warp to your base. Exactly. Because the ultimate goal is to destroy the other base. Right. And so, and again, the, the base itself also has auto cannons that attack you, as well as it's basically not only destroying that, but it's also capturing it. Yeah. And so, in this game, there are three different factions of, of for the spaceships. Uh, one of them being USR, the other one is Zarek, and Titan. And they all play a little differently. Where Titan plays kind of support, and USR is is the aggressive, the aggressor, the attack. The attacking one, yeah. And it's the different factions for the ships because you could still everybody can be you know, using a different faction on the same team. Oh, absolutely. It's just which kind of they're just archetypes for the ships that you can play as. Right. Um, and so you have uh, again uh, support, uh, defense, and attack, and they're also broken. The ships are broken down on the ship tree into moderate. Uh, um, easy, moderate, and hard. I think it was. I think it was moderate, hard, and hardest. Yeah, actually. basically, it's basically just, it's, it's just difficulty because all the ships are right. balanced to fight each other. There isn't any ship that's like the absolute superior. They just play differently, and some of them are harder to use than others. Like you have to know the game more right. to get the effect out of them. And there's also detailed crew cards in this, yes. so that adds another layer. You, you have to assemble your crew, and right. they give you bonuses based on who you've picked. Exactly, and so you have a captain. You have communications. And each of these things buff your ship in a certain way, where yeah. communications will allow you to detect the ships coming from a longer distance. The captain gives you, like, capture rate bonuses exactly. and defense bonuses and things like that. And, again, you have logistics, which helps in your um, secondary attack and fighters you could launch from your ship and stuff like that. So what I really liked about the, the, the cards, though, was just the detail behind them. Yeah. was just how much information was on the card. And they even voiced the card, so when you're in the, in the battle... Fighting against other people, your 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 commander will voice out and say something and have an attitude or have a personality, and that added a lot of depth to me for the game. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the the again, this being a free to play game, there is a premium version of it. Yes, there are microtransactions. Right, and so they have to keep it going somewhere. You get you can buy the platinum currency in this. Right, which is again the platinum, and so that's about five dollars for a thousand platinum. Mm -hmm. And there are three premium ships that you could buy, one for each faction, and the ship costs about $30. Yeah, it's, it's a little steep, but right. um, the, the premium ships don't seem to be too different from the normal ships, so it's not exactly a pay-to-win situation. Right, they're just a little buffed. They're just, they're like a little bit different. Right. So. It's great. I mean, I also enjoyed uh, the fact that, you don't have, again, you, you, using the premium, you can... You can get like experience boosts and uh, currency boosts. Yeah, you, you, it's it's the kind of the paying thing where you pay to unlock things faster. Right. But you're not exactly buying, you're faster. not you're not buying an advantage over other people. No, not you, yet. You can go in with the with the basic ship and still do fine. Oh, absolutely. And again, it also comes down to communicating with your teammates as well. Yeah. Because if if everyone's quiet and everyone goes goes attack like in any MOBA game, and you don't have a healer or a tank, you're just getting a dead in the water. 
Yeah, you have to you have to use coordination. You have to know when to fall back and defend your base. And, right. You know, when to push to other things. So, what are your final thoughts on the game? Um, it was it was pretty enjoyable. I actually only got to play one match mm-hmm. because there's not a whole lot of a player base for this game right now. Right. There's like a hundred to three hundred people on it at any given time, and it took me like ten minutes to queue up. Mm-hmm. So I only ended up playing one match and then just trying out the ships in the firing range, which I really like that there is a firing range that you can actually try stuff out in. Right. And not um, have to worry about progressing. Yeah, not have to worry about progressing. Um, I think if there were more people playing it and I could have gotten some of those later ships, mm-hmm. I would have enjoyed it a lot. Um, I might check it out more when it's out of alpha. Right. I mean, that again, that, that was my impression on it was the fact that it's still in alpha. And even now I'm enjoying the game. Again, like you said, I've progressed three ships down into one, one, one leg of the tree because I tried it out and I really enjoyed it. And the, the, the better the ship I'm getting, the more I'm enjoying, like, Oh, there's a little bit more detail, more stuff here. Like, ooh, awesome. All right. So join us next time when we're going to review another free-to-play game. Yeah, see you next time. Bye-bye. And we're back. Next to me is Sarah Ann Fox. Now, Sarah Ann is a former feature film development executive, not to mention a story editing consultant, and if I'm not mistaken, is a professional expert of screenwriting and storytelling for the Ideas Program at Los Angeles Valley College. Did I do okay? You did great. Okay, and I must mention that you have a nickname? Saran. Saran, so Sarah Ann, we're just going to put together like the rap and call you Saran, okay? Yes. So, (laughs) to start off, tell me, how did you get to where you are? Um, How did you get to be working for a producer at 20th Century Fox, which is no small plan? It was right after my oldest child was born. My my late husband was a screenwriter, and Mm -hmm. he had a... A deal at Fox and he was on the third floor of the executive building where all the creatives were nice. and he was writing a script and I sent out a, I was his story editor oh, that okay. when he wrote scripts I was his consultant helping him with uh, ideas structure characters and so I sent out a letter to all the producers and I wound up working for Michael Gruskoff who had been an agent talent mm-hmm. agent and he was the producer of uh, Young Frankenstein oh, cool. Rafferty and the Goldust Twins Silent Running and I was his reader for about two weeks till he pulled me in to a meeting uh-huh. And for five years, I read every script that came into the office. Wow! Only handed him the good ones. We developed thirty screenplays. Uh, out of those, out of those, all those scripts you read, like in the good ones, that'd be what, like five percent, like one out of a hundred. One in a hundred, one hundred and fifty. Wow! One hundred and fifty mm-hmm. scripts. Mm-hmm. Wow! And the interesting thing is that the good ones were obviously it was like mind gold. Sure. And the bad ones were fun. Are there any like good ones that you could think of off the top of your head? You're like, oh, I know this film's going to be a hit, and then turns out it was developed and made. And... Officer and a gentleman, because during that time you would read scripts that were in the that were other people were working on, mm-hmm. and I remember reading Officer and a Gentleman and knowing that it would be a very big hit. Cool, very big cool. hit. But, but the bad ones were the fun ones. <laughs> it's the mediocre ones where someone kind of had an idea how to write, but yeah. their dialogue was really bland. Those are very frustrating. Yeah, for me. So I bet you sat through a lot of those. I read everything. Right. So tell me what exactly a story editor does. Step by step, let's pretend like someone has no film background, nothing. I can only speak from my own experience. Mm-hmm. I, was his, I was his director of development, and mm-hmm. we would bring in the writer of the script. We never optioned anything. We would say, you're a very good writer. We don't want to option your script. What are you passionate now, about? Let, let's say, for those of you who don't know, what does option mean? Option means you buy a script for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. You have a six month or a year option for five, ten thousand dollars during which time you try to set something up sure. and sell it. And at that time, if, if you option my script, I can't. I yes, can't... it's exclusive. It's exclusive. Absolute. We own the script during that time. Regardless if you make it or not, during that length of time, I am getting paid. Absolutely. And then and... it comes back to you if we don't renew the option. Okay. But it's... if you do renew the option, the next step would be going into development? Into development, into rewrites. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we could always we could also have the option to bring in another writer, okay. which very often happens. Got it. Very often happens. But lots of time you will give the original writer the first shot, mm-hmm. and if it doesn't work, they will bring in a more seasoned writer. Yeah, I always hear horror stories of writers that come in with their, their baby, their script, mm-hmm. they hand it over, sure enough it gets in development, and by the time it's over they can't even recognize it. Absolutely, but they take a very big check to the bank, so, <laughs> so there's that. What, what I did with, was uh, we worked very hard before the writer went off to write a script that we had come up the, for the idea. Mm-hmm. We came up with the idea through story conferencing. We said to the writer, what are you passionate about? What do you want to write? And we would come up with something that we all three agreed upon. They would go, we would talk about it and talk about it. They would go off for two to three months, write it, and come back with the first draft. And then we'd spend two days in my boss's office going mm-hmm. over it page by page, 
Wow. And then there would be a rewrite and a polish, and then we would hand it into the studio. My boss had a first look deal with 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. And out of the 30 scripts that we developed, three got made. Brenner wow. Herzog's Nosferatu, Quest for Fire, uh -huh. and My Favorite Year, which wow. is many people's favorite movie. When I tell people that I worked on that, they get all excited. Yeah, do you have like a story about My Favorite Year? Well, I read a script by a, a, a writer named mm -hmm. Dennis Palumbo, and mm -hmm. we brought him in and said, what have you always wanted to do? And he said, I want to make a movie about Wyatt Earp and a young kid who follows him around. My Wyatt boss, Earp, like the, uh, the Gunshot the, Okay Corral? The, uh, the sheriff. The sheriff, the sheriff yeah, the Western. And my boss said, I don't want to do a Western, but I've always wanted to do a movie about Mel Brooks, who was around the corner, and mm -hmm. his experiences in the 50s on your show of shows, which was Sid Caesar's Comedy yes. Hour. I know that reference. And there were so many stories about what it was. Woody Allen worked on that show, Neil Simon, and, and Mel would tell stories about what it was like to work for crazy Sid, and talented Sid Caesar. Mm. And, and so we went through one writer, we went through another writer, and then we found a third writer who'd worked on Blazing Saddles oh, cool. with Mel. Cause, and then we would sit in Mel's office, and he would talk and talk and talk, and Norman Steinberg would go off and write 15 pages. We'd read them, and then we would all meet together. Wow and talk and go over it and that's that's how it that's how it happened however i skipped something uh when we were talking about it uh, my boss said somebody like errol flynn comes on and is a is a guest and mel's mm -hmm. character has to has to babysit this alcoholic actor to make sure he doesn't <laughs> act up and i said and in the end he becomes actually becomes robin hood and saves the day when something the big crisis on the on the set and so, so it's not, is this taking part of real life and turning it into... Absolutely. And what it was, the creative process. And mm -hmm. all the creative process is, when you're sitting in a story conference, is a series of what-ifs. Mm -hmm. Well, what if this? And what if he did that? And what if he did this? And so what started off as somebody saying, I'd like to do a Western about Wyatt Earp. And by the end of the meeting, mm -hmm. we had an idea and we pulled Mel in. And the rest is history. Wow. The rest it is literally history. is history. It I mean, is that, history, yeah. Those films, that's really and, incredible. And who knew when we walked into the into the room that we would come out with this. Now, is that how most scripts are being done today? I like that, that model I, that you I talked about. I have to about. say I'm not as familiar with, because I work privately with clients now. Mm -hmm. I'm not... I'm not at a studio or working right. with, a, with a producer. Mm -hmm. I think things are much more formulaic now mm -hmm. and difficult because there's less money for development. They want completed scripts now. Yeah. And I think that the people who are in charge have their eye on the bottom line, which is absolutely necessary, sure, but perhaps yeah. a little bit too much. Yeah. You know, they're coming up with these sequels and these reboots that people aren't interested in. Yeah, you know. absolutely. I mean, just mm -hmm. this summer, the summer of blockbusters. So mm -hmm. there's going to be more of that we're going to talk about. We're going to take a quick short break. We're going to watch a sketch, and I'll have more questions for Sarah. So Ted's been with us for a while, and, you know, He's been doing stuff, and people have been saying how great he is, and I haven't been paying attention too much. And so we decided to send him on a field trip with Jason to pitch some of the ideas we have for the show. Yeah, Ted's great. You know, he's got a, he's got a can-do attitude, even though he can't do anything. We like him, though. He's trying. He's, that's, you know, all you could ask. Uh, you just don't want to leave him unsupervised. Okay, okay. Calm down. No one needs to get hurt. Oh, yeah, no, no, I get your money. Okay. They gotta go, Grandma. Hey, man. What are you doing here? Oh, nothing. We were just betting on the Argentina Chile game, and she bet on Chile. No, I mean, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be at that meeting with Ted? No, I told you to go to that meeting. No, see, we talked about this. I can't go to the meeting because I'm supposed to meet with the writers and discuss some sketches. So, if I'm here, and you're here... Oh, shit. So basically, the cactus and the llama use the power of friendship to get to the moon, tear out the wombat's heart, and eventually they get back in time for breakfast to eat chocolate for... I don't know. I love it. I love it. I think we can open it wide. I think we can maybe do a premiere at Sundance. Wow, sweet. This is amazing. I, I don't know how to thank you. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. Speak for us. We don't know this man. Why? He's great. I think he should be in the writing room. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a small room. There's decision already... made, decision made. Have your people call my people, and maybe next week we'll do lunch. Ta-ta, guys. So I'm having a great day. 
How about you guys? Okay, and we're back. Next to me is Saran Fox. I have another onslaught of questions for you. The first one being, uh, I've heard this term that we're in the third age of the third golden age of television. Have you heard that? Uh, platinum. It's the platinum age. Platinum age. There are a lot of people calling it the platinum age. Platinum age of television is what we're currently in. You'd say. Yes, that's what a lot of people are saying. The first one was the fifties, with all the live the live dramas coming out of New York, mm -hmm. and then the one hour dramas, and the second one was the 90s with shows with all the great comedies on NBC and sure. VR yeah. uh, and this is the platinum age the markets have exploded and we have Netflix Hulu Amazon we have basic cable pay TV and network live streaming uh, shows and live streaming <laughs> this show yeah. yeah and uh it's it's a creative boom it's there's so many opportunities for writers actually the showrunner writer now on TV is king when you take a look at David Chase and the Sopranos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bo Williamson on uh Netflix's House of Cards oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Noah Hawley on Fargo and Vince Gilligan Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul these are writer showrunners so the writer is now king like in the theater where the writer is king mm -hmm. so it's a, it's very very different now and so the p writers have so much power and they're and they're hungry all the networks are hungry 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 for original material and what we're seeing is absolutely amazing amazing work it, the things i just mentioned the like game of thrones right. all the great shows the the, uh, the the smaller shows the bigger shows so you know, for me, if I didn't sleep, I could watch everything. That's my <laughs> mantra. If I don't sleep, I could see everything. So my, my DVR queue gets filled up. I'm, I'm watching something called Animal Kingdom on TNT that's based on the Australian movie. And oh, okay. basic, yeah. and the, the casting and the, the writing is so good. And also another one called Queen of the South on mm -hmm. USA, which is about, which is like uh, girl narcos, female narcos. But the, the writing, you know, you take it for granted that the acting's going to be good, but the writing is mm -hmm. stellar. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely stellar. It's such a pleasure. So you say there's more opportunities now for writers? Absolutely. I think, like, sometimes I feel overwhelmed. Like, I see all these shows on, like you said, like, I, I'd have to not sleep in order to watch everything. So how do you selectively pick which shows have, have great writing? Like, how do you know? You, you just, just have to try? You, you dip your toe in. Yeah. I mean, I just finished semi-binge watching the fourth season of Orange is the New Black. Okay. Absolutely riveting. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I missed Friday Night Lights, so last summer I watched 76 episodes in like a month. <laughs> wow. You know that thing where it's two in the morning and you're saying, I could, and you've watched four, and you could say, <laughs> I can watch one more? And this brings us to the yeah. essence of storytelling. That's how pitching. I feel about Mac and Cheetos. Yeah. Just one more. <laughs> yeah, just one more. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't hurt. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. <laughs> wouldn't hurt my cholesterol or anything and like that. And <laughs> this brings us to the essence of storytelling, because I know that pitching, how, how people say, well, what about pitching? The thing about storytelling... So what is, what is pitching? What pitching is is when you give a short version of your story to a studio executive or a producer to try and get your foot in the door. It's mm -hmm. an audition for a relationship. Okay. It's an audition for a second meeting. And every once in a while, you'll get a deal. Got it. So you're saying once upon a time, your producer and his assistant or her assistant, in my view, they're four years old. And it's right after the nap, and they want a story. So it's once okay. upon a time. That's okay. all pitching is, beginning, middle, end. And I will tell you a story. Paul Schrader, who wrote Taxi Driver, was also known as one of the great pitchers in Hollywood. And he told a story years ago at a, at a Writers Guild event mm -hmm. that I went to with my late husband. And he said, uh, I'm exactly going to exaggerate a little, but not much. He went to MGM, went to a producer's suite, and started to say, this is the story of... And he was four paragraphs in when he needed to use the facilities. Excuse me. Gets up. When he comes out of the bathroom, they're standing there saying, and then what happens? <laughs> so when you think about it, that is the essence of Shakespeare, soap operas, uh -huh. any story. Yeah. We invest in compelling characters and situations, and we want to know what happens next. It's very, very basic. And then it's, of course, all in the execution. But a, a good story is a good story. If you've ever stayed home sick and watched a soap opera, uh -huh. you know that if you're going to be sick the next day, you're going to watch it again. I was on one and I was sucked in. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> actually, I got a curveball I'm going to throw you away. So, in your analogy, you know, you have to like, oh, what happens next to be continued? But with the advent of streaming, mm -hmm. you could have, like, Orange is the New Black, the entire series mm -hmm. just in one night. So, mm -hmm. the writer doesn't really have an opportunity to see how the audience is reacting on an episode-by-episode -episode basis. That's Would you absolutely agree? That's absolutely true, and I think it's like it's like the the lady or the tiger in a way. You know, which one am I going to choose? 
there is a wonderful thing about uh, weekly shows like on, on regular TV mm -hmm. where you have to wait. Right. There's something about the anticipation about and that. the wondering mm -hmm. and, the, and the wonder. It's a beautiful frustration. That's what it is. When they end, you go, oh, shoot, I have to wait a week. And then there's the other thing, the luxury of being able to do that, mm -hmm. where you tell the story in one continuous loop or over several nights. Mm -hmm. So I think one is not better than the other. It's a personal choice, you know? Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, in order to switch things up, I uh, so you work with a lot of writers, a lot of mm -hmm. clients. So <laughs> let's say you've got someone who's writing and it's, uh, it's not quite that gripping. You know, it's mm -hmm. not what you're talking about. How do you gingerly talk to writers without bruising egos, without discouraging them in order to get their mm -hmm. stories up to that level? Well, I tell film students, get a film vocabulary. I say Google the AFI's 100 Greatest American Films and watch all of them. I, I've done that. Watched them and all. then all the foreign films and watch all of them. Mm -hmm. And then read scripts. And read the script of your favorite movie, Chinatown is the film that I put out there. Sit with your back to the screen, listen to the dialogue. Um, here's the thing about writing or working as a story editor. Mm -hmm. I can help you with your structure, with new characters, with changing the sex of your main character. The butler did it instead of the maid. Let's be in Chicago instead of New York. Sure. What I cannot do as a story editor is teach you how to write good dialogue. You have to have a good ear. Uh -huh. You have to get one, have one, develop it. Then you would hire, if you don't have that, you hire me to rewrite because I'm also a screenwriter. Right. So there's the line in the sand. If you can't write dialogue, you either need to learn how to do it yeah. or give it up. I think that's the first thing when I'm watching a show. If the dialogue isn't on point, yeah. it's the first thing that Absolutely. That goes. And people look yeah. at the page and they think, well, I can do that. There isn't much on the page. Yeah. I could write a screenplay. It's, no. Yeah. I'm currently watching Peaky Blinders. Yes, me too. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm there's... two episodes in. Me too. Yes. Me too. And just, it's, it's the dialogue. It's so specific that yes. not anyone off the street is just like, oh, I could write a show like that. Like that, that, a lot of research you could tell went into that. You know, yes. And getting that, you know, so. It's quirky and it's powerful. Yes. It's mysterious. Mm -hmm. It's never on the nose. Right, yeah. And also, of course, I could go, I could, we could do another segment on great acting, but yeah. the power of stillness in someone like Cillian Murphy. Sure. The, you, as an actor, yeah. you know that. How, yeah. how powerful just being still is. Absolutely. And it, because the camera picks up so much, screen actors are taught to move very economically because mm -hmm. the camera picks everything up. Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. So, um, changing gears once again. So, where can people sort of connect with you, find you? Uh, yeah. Well, um, students at LA Valley College. I, um, so, do you work with? I work with students, and I work with high school students uh -huh. and students here and in other uh, community colleges. I sit on advisory boards, run workshops, guest lecture, and teach. They can contact me through Dan Watanabe, our sure. supervisor. Right. And, and your website? And my website is? www.fox-editworks.com. No. www. <laughs> it's okay. No. W, that's why I'm here. www.fox-editswork, E-D-I-T-S-W-O-R-K, dot com. See, that was an example of editing. That we yes, just there we go. There. All right, well, Saran, thank you so much so for being mu on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Absolute Phil. Absolute pleasure. back next to me is Robert Robert's gonna ask me a few questions a little bit about that clip that you just saw and what's coming up so Robert take it away so my first thing is where the inspiration for this uh, play came come 
Is it a play? What is it exactly? Okay, so that's Cliff of Time. It's a play uh, that I just made a trailer for. Um, it's 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 actually a one act, one man show, and there's a cast of fourteen people. <laughs> so, would you like to explain that? Bill? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna need to explain it. So um, I met with my director. Uh, his name is Wolfgang Bodison. He's a great guy, great actor. I don't know if you've ever seen A Few Good Men, but he's the the private that. Tom Cruise defends. He's the really okay. tall black guy, like really built. Wow. So he's my director. So I approached him with the thing and I was like, you know what, I really want to do this short play. It's just one guy that's a boxer. You know, I'll work on it for a couple months and we'll put it up. And he's like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'll do all the costume, I'll do all the wardrobe, I'll, I'll produce the thing because it's a one man show. But slowly <laughs> he's added all these roles. So now there's like dancers, there's my trainers, my manager, there's violinists, wow. there's other boxers. <laughs> So the cast is ballooned, and now I have to clothe and, you know, get all these props. Right. So it's become a two-act epic piece. Wow. So there's 15 fights. There's, like, six dances. There's, like, a lot of stuff going on. But it's all the original text. Right. And, and so, so where, where is it showing? So it'll be in North Hollywood, specifically Playhouse West Theater. So um, there's a flyer, I think, attached to that. But it's 10643 um, Magnolia Boulevard. And awesome. it'll be... Friday, this Friday, the July 8th is opening night. Got it. And so how long will it run? It's going to run three weekends. Wow. So uh, I think the closing day will be like the 24th of uh, July. Awesome. And what, what are the show times? Is it uh, Friday and Saturday at 8 o'clock and Sunday at 7? And the best part of all is that it's actually free. Wow. Is it free? Yeah, it's free. It's free. You just need to make a reservation online. and. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's totally free. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, so, so what are you getting out of this? So I'm eating a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get to be the star, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, I get to box a lot. I've been training for months. I've been wow. at a boxing gym for three or four. I go to um, Wild Card boxing in, in Hollywood and that's Shout out the to gym them. that's Manny Pacquiao's trainer is the owner of that gym Freddie Roach oh wow so I've got to meet him uh, a couple times I've had like boxing um, instructions I'm pretty proficient so it's just so, so it's a, all legitimate now it's, it's no it's, yeah. it really is quite legitimate you know that's um, awesome so you'll get to see me down these gloves um, it, it's a really good piece mm -hmm. um, you know I, most theater productions don't have promo videos but I thought right. uh, so I was gonna say, but besides that video, what's what's the like one hook to like for for people to, uh, in the play they, they they can share without spoiling it? What's the one hook? Yeah, it's <sighs> one hook. I the thing is the dancers got me. Like when you said, yeah. it's a boxing film with dancers. Yeah. I, I instantly went to like the Big Lebowski in the back of my head. There's a there's a ballet. There's a swing number. There's a couple what? hip hop numbers. Yeah, oh, everyone's wow. half naked, so it's got something for everyone. Sold. All, Absolutely all, sold. All the boxers are half naked. <laughs> box Wait. Then, all the day. Oh, oh. oh wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's it's gonna be fun. Awesome. It's gonna be a good time, you know. Uh, so it will it'll be like an hour and a half long show. Uh, we're transforming the the set into a real legit boxing ring. In fact, I'm gonna make a shout out to someone who's actually behind the camera right now. Right. Our set designer is Matt Piper. So he Woo! is he's he's around. He's actually he's gotten the pads from mm -hmm. the side. You know, we got the little stool. My cut men come out. Give me water, towel me off. Like it's, wow. it's quite legit, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no. It's, I mean, definitely for free. Might, <laughs> might I stress this enough, guys? For free. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So um, that that's it. You know, I hope you guys come see it. Definitely. You know, thanks for giving me this opportunity just oh, to no plug a little bit. But yeah. So, so on, on that note, <laughs> on that um, note. That, that's gonna be it for our show today. Um, remember to like and follow and subscribe as well. Absolutely. And you can catch us in two weeks. So Sunday the seventeenth, I believe, at one p.m. Absolutely. Bye-bye. See ya.